landfills down the street. No, I'm here. This is the scrapyard. This is my scrap. This isn't scrap, though. This is trash. No, 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 it's scrap. It's not trash. I got a little bit of everything in here. Like, uh, look, I got uh, steel, right? Copper. Yeah. Um, here, wire. Yeah? You guys love wire. You're supposed to cut the ends off. Like, this... This isn't supposed to be here. Uh, you know, you're right. That's my bad. All right, those are good. Those are keys. Those are brass. Oh, yeah, I was looking for those. This is pencils. Okay, yeah, no, they're pencils, but look, see? There's metal. They're so... Okay, now this is not scrap. This is trash. No, I hear you, but look, so it's shiny and anything that's got this kind of a coating is made out of aluminum or sometimes silver, which is bad for the environment, by the way, and I'm doing my part by responsibly recycling this. I'll give you 20 bucks. 25? Get out of here. <laughs> Hello pandas, just a chill video this week. No fancy project, so if you're an experienced scrapper, you may not get as much out of this one. But many of us are less experienced, so that's what this one is. Beginner tips on how to maximize your payout for scrap metal. Now, I've covered this stuff in bits and pieces throughout other videos that are more focused on specific materials and how to clean and sort them, so I'll link a few of those for anybody who's interested. But understanding how your scrapyard works goes a long way towards building good habits and ensuring you aren't missing out on any easy money. So that's what we'll go over here. The first and most important thing is to have everything sorted properly. Now some scrapyards are a bit more flexible than others, but many will buy a bin of mixed materials at the lowest possible value of all of the items that are in it. Think of it like a microwave or a washing machine that you haven't disassembled at all. They're just gonna buy it for the steel shred price. It's not a ripoff. They have labor costs to cover when sorting and separating the stuff that you bring in if you're not gonna do it. Larger yards have more advanced equipment to do this, so if you bring in a box of copper aluminum CPU coolers, they'll be able to give you a copper aluminum price. Whereas smaller yards that have to separate those by hand, it's just gonna be extruded aluminum. So have all of your separate bins before you go. Copper, aluminum, dirty, clean. Do all of the separation that you're able or willing to do before you show up and you'll be in control of your payout. A couple points about grading in a general sense. Grading is based on the recovery percentage of the material. So copper number two means there's a certain amount of paint or solder that's being weighed in along with it, or a certain amount will be lost when melting it down, like with that uh, doll hair style copper wire. When they buy and sell something as clean aluminum, what that actually means is that it's 95% pure aluminum. So what I've found is when I show up with a 100 pound bin of clean aluminum and a couple pounds of dirty stuff, I just wasn't able to efficiently remove the last bolt or there's a single bar that's painted, they'll usually just throw it all in together and weigh it and pay me for clean because there's that 5% contamination that's expected. But I let them make that call, or at least point out the one bolt on the, the one piece in the bin, because I don't want them thinking I'm trying to be sneaky. If you want to upgrade your material, you can cut all of the solder-coated parts off of your copper pipe and separate them into number one and number two. Upgrading into bare bright is more difficult. You could leave it in a bin of vinegar or ketchup for a while and then scrub it with steel wool or put it in a rock tumbler or... Go for it if you want to. Finally, there are several grades of steel you should know about. Most steel would just go into the shred pile, but brake drums are a higher grade because they're cast. Some places have higher prices for all cast iron, and the really thick pieces can go in as prepared steel, which is a higher value as well. Taking the time to sort by grade as well as material is an important step to getting the most money out of it. Knowing who you're selling to and researching your options is huge. Different yards will offer different prices on various materials for a number of reasons. This is why I frequent several different scrap yards, because they all have the best price on something, but not everything. And that's because they don't all sell to the same places. They have contracts with a number of different outfits. One of them will have a great buyer for car parts, but be weaker on electric motors. 
They also have different equipment, so while one of them could have really efficient logistics for steel, but do everything else by hand, that'll allow them to give a great price for steel, but have trouble staying competitive in other areas. Logistics have a huge impact as well. Most of this stuff is processed overseas, so if you live on a coastal area, your scrap prices may be higher. Whereas a smaller scrapyard in a smaller town in the center of a large landmass is going to have higher shipping costs, so they won't be able to pay as much in acquisition. The smaller scrapyard may not even be shipping to a refinery, they could just be driving their stuff one town over to a larger amalgamator and essentially acting as a middleman. Which is exactly what most full-service scrapyards are doing with catalytic converters. Until you get to know what's available, it's important to check all your options, make some calls, and go with the one that's right for you. A few phone calls won't get you all the information either. You'll need to visit each of them a few times to really figure out how they like to do things, because for all the reasons I mentioned, they'll all have slightly different methods of grading. I have one yard I won't take wire or extruded aluminum to because they're so picky about how they want those things sorted and I can't be bothered to organize eight different bins of wire. If you're bringing in significant volume, however, it may be worth your while to do that. You just need to try a few different ones before deciding which yard best fits your needs. Now the most important things as far as your scrapyard is concerned are volume and loyalty. Volume being the amount that you bring in at any given time. The most expensive thing for any business is labor, so if you show up three times a week with smaller loads, that costs them more than if you just showed up once with all of it. Every scrapyard I've been to has volume incentives because of this. Some yards will bump up your price if you have over 100 pounds of wire or maybe 500 pounds of batteries. This is why you should save up your scrap and go in when you have a, a full load of one or two things, rather than a truckload of every little kind of thing. That's not always possible, but at least make the most of your time and theirs by making the exchange high value for both of you. This gives you bargaining power, and you could ask for a price increase on one or two things, even if you don't quite meet the threshold. This won't work if they've never seen you before though, so that's where the loyalty thing comes in. Once you've found a yard you like, if they get to know you as a regular, they'll be more likely to take care of you, even if you don't bring in two tons every month. If they get to know you as that annoying person that always calls for prices but never shows up, you'll have to take what they give you. This one is less important because you don't have much control over it, but when you go can affect your payout. If you roll in 10 minutes before closing or on a busy Monday after a long weekend, they'll be less interested in discussing the fine details of your backpack full of doorknobs. If you want to have a chat, then show up in the morning or just after lunch. The market fluctuations can be... Well, it can be fun stacking your copper and brass and watching the prices rise and fall. Just remember that scrapyards are quick to respond to a fall and slow to a sudden spike, so timing the market is not the same as day trading. Still, different economies and construction projects will have an effect on the price of metal, and it can be fun holding on to some and cashing out when the price is high. The value of scrap can be higher in the summer when construction season is booming, and I've also noticed that scrap prices tend to follow the US election season as well. Scrap prices go down leading up to an election because of perceived uncertainty in the future, and then spike right back up after the whole country breathes a collective sigh of relief. That's not scientific, it's just a trend I've noticed, but if you're sitting on a pile of scrap leading up to an election, I would suggest hanging on to it until after, when the prices seem to firm up. Finally, the best way to increase your payout at a scrapyard is knowing what you're selling. Some scrapyards will take advantage of you, and others just don't know much about certain materials. If you do your testing and your sorting, then you won't have someone giving you steel shred price for a pile of copper-filled transformers or magnetic stainless steel. Most yards are happy to explain things to you, but there is a point where you should refuse the sale if you're being shortchanged. But in order to do that, you need a little knowledge and experience and some lessons you're gonna learn the hard way. That's what I'm making these videos for. So if they're helping, leave a like to show some love and subscribe for more scrap metal tips and guides. Leave it better than you found it. Keep doing the thing.